That's it. What, one of those. Yeah, yeah. Could be anywhere. Okay. I, I, I would very much like now to introduce Dr. Hilary Cass. And uh, she's come here. She's president of the Royal uh, College of, of, of uh, uh, Pediatrics and Child Health. Uh, and I think we're very privileged to have her here. We've, we've known H Hillary uh, as a previous uh, consultant, or still a consultant may maybe, at Guy's and St. Thomas's, and as someone who was head of school of pediatrics in the, the London Deanery. So uh, we've obviously had very close and effective relations between KSS and, and London over, over many years in pediatrics. Um, we, the College of uh, Pediatrics and Child Health is, of course, a very young college. 18 years, I think. Um, the, the College of the Royal College of Physicians is a little bit older. I think it's now 496 years. And uh, we were talking er, er, earlier about one of our colleagues was talking about uh, the length of his title. Well, my current title is Senior Censor and Vice President for Education and Training, which I think is quite long, but I'm, I'm not quite sure who wins on Scrabble, but we can, we can perhaps debate that, uh, that later. But, of course, the College of Physicians being around for all those, those years is a bit like a sort of a large old crocodile. You know, there's not a lot of ev ev evolution, but we're quite successful. But the College of Pediatrics is clearly thinking about uh, rapid evolution, and that's why we've asked Hillary to come here today to talk about uh, 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 the multidisciplinary uh, approach to, to, uh, to pediatrics, to child health, and education, and really to give us some, some food for thought about the way forward. So, Hilary. Okay, well, ap apologies for the trainers. This is, uh, this is not trendy, young, North American look. It's uh, plantar fasciitis, which is driving me stir crazy. So, solutions on a postcard at the end. Um, but, um, I, I, well, now, now David said that about, um, about our colleges, I have to retell the story I just uh, told him over, over tea break when we were talking about this. When I was registrar at the College of Pediatrics, which was about eight years ago, I thought I'd better go and see a few other registrars and find out what a registrar is supposed to do. So I went to see uh, the then registrar at the RCP, and I <coughs> had uh, left my tacky little hot desk in a corner of uh, RCPCH, and I was entertained in the very sumptuous uh, registrar's suite at the RCP. Uh, I should say I am also a fellow of the RCP, so I'm allowed to uh, say all this. And um, anyway, so he said to me, so how long has your post been in existence at the College of Pediatrics? And I said, oh, you know, since we started, so about 10 years. And he said, I see, well, of course, my post was established in 1563. And um, my brother-in-law said afterwards, did you ask if he was the first incumbent? <laughs> um, Anyway, so I, I, I just want to take you through a bit of background about why um, I've been thinking and uh, we're now thinking very actively about a very different way of being within our college. Um, and so I guess I have to put this in the context of the world in which we live. And it starts off slightly, a slightly depressing take. And this is, uh, I don't know who's seen this, but this is from Anita Charlesworth, who was the uh, chief economist at the Nuffield. She just did her outgoing blog um, last week um, and uh, showed a rather depressing picture on, of health spend f as a percentage of GDP gradually kind of uh, on a downward slide. But this is how it was in, in the heyday when uh, we were, um, does this, oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not a pointer. Let's try this one. Is that a pointer? Oh, yeah. So here, here, here's, um, oh, forget that. Anyway, you can see things are getting, you know, we had a lot of spend in the NHS and then uh, we've flatlined. Uh, that's not a cardiological term, that's a financial term. And she was modeling the scenarios as to what might happen after this flatline period. And either we carry on flatline or we go back to our historic growth, or the middle option is that we maintain our uh, position as a percentage of GDP. Um, and what she estimates is that the only way you can do anything other than continuing to flatline is if 
you uh, take substantial money out of social care or put taxes up to a level that won't be palatable for any government. Um, so the financial situation is not promising. Uh, and then this is from Roy Lilly's blog. I don't know if anyone follows Roy Lilly. It's worth doing. You can get um, a, a sort of cynical but fast view of what's going on in the NHS if you follow his blog. But it's, you know, if we think we've got a big problem with Nicholson Challenge here, it's uh, only going to get bigger as time goes on. So um, what cash short? Now, why, why is that relevant in terms of uh, the way in which we're planning to go for the college? And I hope that will become apparent as I uh, go on. So one thing I've learned in this job is not to believe all the things that I apparently say in the papers, um, because the guys who write the headlines are not the same people who've interviewed you. Um, and this looks uh, fairly depressing. Um, uh, and I, I, I should say that I didn't say uh, most of the things you read in those headlines. But it is fair to say that I have said that things are not going well in children's health care. Um, and that we need to do something fundamentally different about it. And sometimes I feel like this person. Now, does anyone know who this is? I'm going to help you. Um, does that help? Now do you know who it is? Yes. Um, it, you're not going to admit it if you know it now, are you? But it's Senna from up Pompeii, who used to run around saying, well, well, the, end, well the end of the world is... Uh, Nigh. And uh, so when I'm uh, um, raising concerns about uh, you know, the state of children's health services, that's how it sometimes feels. But I think it is justified because we're not performing as well as we would wish to be. Um, and so just in terms of the take that I get and the soundings I get from the front line, um, when I came into post, I did quite a lot of road shows and webinars and running around the country speaking to different specialty groups, um, obviously interacting with other colleges, the academy, uh, DH, ministers, and then quite a lot of time talking to other children's healthcare professionals and particularly the voluntary sector, uh, media, our own staff and officers, and then a huge amount of time responding to emails and, uh, and uh, on social media and so on. Uh, very occasionally I'd see some patients and even more rarely my friends and family. But what came out of that was um, a raft of issues that were bothering people at the front line. And obviously, there were the things that you would expect around access to training, equal training opportunities, uh, working time directive, act access to academic posts. But a huge concern, really, about cuts, finances, um, uh, how people were doing at implementing our standards, reconfiguration models of care, what it was going to be like having a consultant uh, portfolio career. Uh, we were by that time talking about consultant delivered care. Um, and what would that mean if you were resident on call in the early part of your consultant career? How would you get out of that resident role as you got older with retirement age going up. So uh, you, huge issues about how the service is going to be delivered and how you're going to sustain the service. And those are the sorts of things that we as paediatricians were certainly not going to be able to fix and tackle on our own. So what are the challenges for children's health care that, 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 that we're facing and uh, where's, where's my data coming from? Um, well, this is um, <clears throat> a paper that was in the Lancet last year, um, and uh, there was a previous paper a couple of years before that, which shows how we're doing in our all-cause mortality for children compared to the rest of Western Europe. And if I give you a blow-up, that, that light blue line is us. We're the worst in Western Europe. We started off in the middle of the pack, um, and we've actually ended up with the highest all-cause mortality in children under 14. Now, there's a sort of cognitive dissonance about that. People say, well, that's probably not really, there must be something wrong with the figures. Well, the figures have been repeated a couple of times uh, already uh, by different authors, and guess what? They still come out the same. Um, and what that means, if you calculate that, is if you compare us to Sweden, which is the best performing country, and you adjust um, for... Um, for population. There are 2,000 excess deaths of children per annum in this country compared to uh, if we were doing as well as Sweden. Now, plainly, that's not all healthcare amenable. 
There are you know, much broader determiners, but some of it absolutely is healthcare amenable um, and about doing better. And some of the rest of it is, is, is about um, uh, um, uh, poverty. Some of it's about what goes on in pregnancy, smoking in pregnancy, obesity in pregnancy, antenatal care. So there's a raft of issues that go well beyond what pediatricians are doing uh, and encompass society, but also the whole healthcare workforce. And if you look at this, this is our asthma deaths compared to the rest of Europe. Um, and um, and we are, uh, we're here, this red dot here. Now, you could say that, of course, you have more asthma deaths because you've got more asthma. That's, those are the prevalence figures. But if you look at Germany, which is another industrialized country, uh, there's their prevalence, which is also relatively high, but their deaths are low. So clearly, there's room for improvement. That's a really health amenable uh, problem. And then if we look at mortality, and that's a pretty blunt tool to say how well are we doing for children, um, there's a raft of other issues that sit under that, chronic care, health promotion, optimised development and protection and social well-being. So where's all this going? Where it's going to is that the impact that paediatricians have on children's health is one part of a much bigger, a much, much more important jigsaw. And if you are an organisation, as we are, that claims to be leading the way in children's health, you cannot be leading the way in children's health um, with just um, a group of doctors. So, um, children aren't small adults. Um, they, they need more than just traditional care. Uh, so let's just think about this and think about what we need to look after this guy to keep him healthy. So we need to treat his minor episodic illnesses. Uh, we need to do a bit of health promotion and stop him smoking. And we need to keep him employed because that's good for his mental health, but it also makes him a net producer. Now, this chap's a bit more tricky. Uh, he's probably got a few chronic diseases. He definitely needs mental health services, if you take a look. He may need social services. He may be vulnerable. But this kid here needs a whole lot of other stuff, antenatal care, parenting advice, vaccinations. He's got preschool input, um, health education. He may be vulnerable. He may also need social services, acute services, and he may need chronic care. So there's a lot of other people involved in the game here. And actually, if you really want to look at children's well-being, then you start early and you look at the number of words that children have depending on their social circumstances at age three. The, dis the disadvantage cycle starts really early uh, when you look at that. So I started to say, what's our role in children's health, partly as healthcare professionals, partly as researchers, as society, but also as a college? Um, and um, so that started to put me on the track of saying we need to think about this rather differently. And if we think about health services investment and how it happens and who lobbies for it, um, uh, on the surface of it, the government sets strategic direction, but in reality it's running on reactive politics and it's running on short election cycles. Um, Clinicians have capability, but we've also got our own silos and special interests um, and all sorts of reasons to defend whether it's our specialty or our hospital or whatever else. And much bigger emphasis on what patients think, um, but they may have a different uh, risk perception and they'll also have local and specialist interests. So they're not always completely the honest broker or, um, either or the, or the objective judge of things. So everybody um, is coming at this from a series of different interests. And so there's a, a raft of decisions we need to make about um, 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 health promotion compared to these disease uh, prevention, uh, how much we invest in pediatric care compared to adult care, um, um, uh, molecule research compared to if we changed our health services, there's very poor health services research and yet getting health service changes right is going to be what has the big bang for buck. Gene therapy as opposed to community nurses and then the whole local versus specialist uh, um, debate. Um, should we invest more in early intervention or um, getting half our outturn into university? And if you want to get seriously political, it's how much do you put in health compared to Trident missiles and how much do you put in social protection compared to holding down taxes? So where does the college feature in all of this? 
Um, and that is what we're arguing uh, against. Well, I'm not arguing against it. That would be ridiculous. Um, but that's, that's where investment is rightly going. Um, and, uh, you know, the more infirm I get, as you see, the more I think that investing in the elderly is a jolly good thing. But it's not my job to promote that at the moment. Um, so this, is, this was the Secretary of State in 2012 being really clear about the priority being care of the elderly and dementia, which is, is huge. Um, but in the course of all of this, um, one of the really disappointing things is despite what I showed you about those, those headlines and how poorly we're doing for children, we had um, a paediatrician on, on the Secretary of State's Living Well for Longer um, uh, working group. Oh, I've got a buzz. Um, and um, what ca and, and the, everybody was very interested to hear the paediatric figures, but when the report came out, children didn't feature at all. Not a word about it. Um, uh, you want to take, take that? And <laughs> um, so not a word about kids in that. And yet, if you add up the cumulative years lost from uh, premature child mortality, it's a bigger killer than liver disease. So, um, you know, we're not doing well from a lobbying point of view. There is a Children's and Young People's Health Outcome Forum, that's 40 um, independent experts um, who were omitted by government to say, okay, what do we need to do to improve outcomes for children? And that's absolutely cross-health sector. Um, it's got uh, people from the voluntary sector, it's got paediatricians, it's got nurses, it's got um, allied health professionals, it's got child psychiatrists, it's a really cross-public uh, health, really cross-cutting group. And um, they had a six-month time frame to come out with a document saying, what do we need to do to improve things for children? They did a stonkingly good job and they got buy-in from pretty much the whole sector and the government. And why did they manage to achieve that? Well, none of those individuals were there to represent their organization. They were there because they were respected individuals. But one of them, for example, was the RCN children's uh, advisor. And because she was on that group, the RCN pretty rapidly signed up to the conclusions. Um, the RC psych had the faculty lead for child and adolescent psychiatry. They weren't there representing their college, but because they had contributed to this, it got rapid buy-in. But that group is not going to exist, I don't think, beyond this administration. So what happens when that group goes down? The other interesting thing about that group is the co-chairs, one of them the medical director at Alder Hay Children's Hospital, and the other Christine Lenahan, who is um, a social worker by background and chair of the Council for Disabled Children. They have access, direct access, to the Secretary of State, and my access is to the Junior Health Minister. So that's how powerful a group that represents the whole health sector is compared to a group representing doctors. So, um, what about colleges and how they sit in the wider world? Um, well, where did we come from? We came from education, hence the name colleges, um, setting standards, quality assuring education through the visiting process, and you know the strong medical power base. We live in another world now. Um, the uh, influence has changed, um, all everything that you know about PMAT-B, specialty schools, the loss of the visiting process, and the changing status of doctors in society. And so we've all evolved. We're all doing more around service standards and advocacy and research and policy. But those are the things that, by everything I've said up till now, I hope you'll be convinced, are things that are not down to monoprofessional um, uh, development and engagement. And we've got problems coming over the horizon. As job plans get tighter, we're highly reliant on members' time, um, and people are less able to get away from the coalface to support college work. Um, so, um, you know, how much do we influence compared to the third sector? The voice of the third sector is very powerful. I used to be a trustee of WizKids, uh, which is a wheelchair charity. Now, Ruth Owen, who's the chief exec there, who's a pretty shrewd cookie, she had Ed Balls eating out of her hand, and, um, and then the day that, um, uh, that the new administration was in, she was in Lansley's diary before Cameron was in Lansley's diary, 
And when Lansley looked like a dead man walking, she'd lined up the next one so that she had, you know, she'd covered pretty much all possible bases so that as soon as he went down, uh, she had the next Secretary of State lined up. And I looked at this smooth operation and I thought, we doctors don't uh, know um, peanuts about lobbying compared, compared to this. So um, what about our college then? Um, I think we're punching above our weight on uh, some of the things I've just been talking about. But I do think there's a lot of scope to think about some radical new ideas. Um, and this is, what we, this is how we set up our college. We didn't mention paediatricians in our objects. We talked about advancing the art and science of paediatrics, raising the standard of medical care to children, educating and examining all those concerned with uh, the health of children, and advancing the education of the public. And this is our mission and vision, transforming child health through knowledge, innovation, and expertise, um, and a healthier future for children and young people across the world. So very broad. So I looked across the world, um, and this is the Paediatric Society of New Zealand. Now, they are a multi-professional, multi-agency organization, and they are the go-to voice for government. Very similar set of objectives to ours. So they were set up in the 1940s, and in 2000, they said, we're going to open up our doors to other child health professionals. And there were all sorts of worries about you know, what that would mean and paediatricians losing their power and status. Now, 14 years on, there's still 66% of them are paediatricians, but they've grown in terms of their membership, um, and they've become more influential. Um, now, if you're a paediatrician in New Zealand, you'll get your CPD and training and all of that through the Australasian College of Physicians, and this organization does all the other stuff. So, um, they're very clear. They're not taking over the role of any other professional body. They're just recognizing that by working together, you can do more. And so that was when, uh, here's we get to the denouement, I came up with this proposal for how our college should go forward, that we would have one arm um, that, and this is taking feedback from paediatricians and wanting to make sure that they control their own affairs. So one arm that's the college arm um, doing training assessment, and most importantly, that we should do more around career support for people who weren't in training grades. That was really clearly the message. You need to do more for all the rest of us. And that would stay paediatric, controlled by a paediatric council. Overarching board of trustees, um, probably still maintaining a majority of paediatricians. But in this other arm, we would open up to anyone working in the field of children's health. So that bit would be essentially like the Paediatric Society of New Zealand, and that bit would do what the Australasian College of Physicians does. And we had a lot of input into this model. We spoke to, uh, we had you know, road shows, we spoke to the voluntary sector organizations, we spoke, spoke to other professionals to make sure that they would be interested to join. We spoke to our specialty group, a, a lot of consultation informally. And then we did a formal consultation between October and December of last year. Uh, that went out to all pediatricians and another document to people who were not pediatricians asking for responses and we had forced choice and open text comments, and we had nine focus groups, and we had an independent consultant conducting it, and we had external statistical analysis uh, to, to validate it. And this is the outcome. <coughs> we had a 15% response, which may not sound huge, but it's about as much as you ever get for any, any kind of, I mean, that's about the turnout we get for our president elections, and it's larger than the turnout on a referendum on the health and social care bill. But most importantly, the statistical analysis looked at it to say, is it representative of um, all groups by age, by geography, by grade, by whether they work in hospital and community? And it was absolutely consistent um, across all groups. And, we, and the thematic analysis was consistent with uh, the quantitative analysis. Um, so the headline findings were that there was really broad support for us moving to a multi-professional model. And we, we consulted on three different things. One was no change. One was the two-armed model I showed you. One arm, the paediatric, so doctors for doctory bit, and the other arm, the multi-professional bit. And the third option was a fully multi-professional college. Um, uh, and what came out was 76% wanted one of the two change options. But in terms of which one they wanted, 
Um, and, and they said, you know, this should be the way forward. We aspire to being advocates for children. We work in multi-professional teams, um, original, realistic, and so on. Um, um, uh, people saying it would make our voice stronger. It's essential to being uh, more integrated, uh, uh, better, you know, strategically, and so on. Um, there were some people who were against it, obviously, who said, you know, this, well, they, we've been, this has allowed us to speak out for children having our own college. There's no evidence that a foundation of child health will be more influential than the colleges ourselves. They were worried about allying with other organizations. Well, it wouldn't be organizational membership. It would be individual membership. Um, and um, you know, worrying about, clearly worrying about uh, weakening um, our democracy by having other people coming in. But anyway, this is, the, this is a, a more, another version of that uh, picture I've just shown you. So here was the actual vote on the three options. Uh, in favor of no change, staying the way we are to, uh, of those who, who, who actually voted on, on this part of the questionnaire, 217. In favor of the two-armed model, 1208. And uh, nearly at about another 500 who said you're being too namby-pamby and go for a fully multi-professional college. Um, so, um, you know, these were the sorts of things that people were saying about option two. It will deliver the multi-professional agenda, but um, uh, it will uh, safeguard our, our um, training and assessment roles. Um, uh, they yeah, sub strongly support two, it, yeah, again, separating the professional part from the multi-professional part. And then these were the sorts of, um, we don't want change. This is a, a, a corker, really. Um, uh, I support some kind of child health foundation, but don't really want the college to be looking after professionals that I'm subsidizing. I want my training to be regulated by doctors, not nurses and not midwives. But I think some of this is about not understanding that, um, that, 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 that the, we'd have that separation and uh, that it wouldn't be uh, anyone but doctors who are running and pediatricians who are running what I loosely call the left-hand side of the college. In terms of costs, we already do cross-subsidize our policy and um, advocacy work, but a lot of that work comes from external grants um, for applying to the National Audit Program and so on, and we would ensure that the money that supports uh, professional functions and professional training uh, was ring-fenced and that any new monies that were needed for new initiatives on the foundation side would have to be uh, um, earned through um, external funding. So we've got some clear governance uh, procedures in place to safeguard that. So um, this is, you know, really my question is, um, you know, across the children's healthcare workforce, does our shared purpose outweigh our differences? Um, and obviously, um, I, I think it, it does. Um, uh, uh, the next steps in this are that we need to just hammer down uh, the detail of the proposals and they take them back to council in July. Uh, if it passes in uh, council in July, it will go to an extraordinary general meeting in September and then to the Privy Council in October. Having said all of that, there is a very loud but vocal minority who are strongly opposed to this uh, from the, 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 the small numbers I showed you who are putting a motion to our AGM next week uh, calling for a referendum and saying this is going to destroy the fundamental nature of our college. Now, I mean, from my point of view, the issue about a referendum is we've just got a larger turnout than we've ever had for a referendum, so how would we interpret another, refer another referendum um, and, you know, if, even if we have another referendum, it's still, because of the way the Privy Council works, you still have to get the changes agreed at a face-to-face -face extraordinary general meeting. So you'll then have had the consultation plus a referendum, plus you still have to go to an extraordinary general meeting to pass the changes. So my own view is that would uh, confuse things. And, uh, I, I, you know, and particularly if we got a smaller turnout the second time, how on earth would you make sense of it? But anyway, that's, uh, that's all very exciting because that's happening next week. And those of you who are paediatricians, make sure you come to the meeting and vote whatever you think about it because the more people we have, the more representative it is. 
Um, so that's where we're at, and I'd be really interested to hear if A, people think this is a good idea for us, but B, if you think you know, some of the same issues um, apply uh, to other parts, to other colleges and um, uh, other aspects of work. You're, you're clearly in the middle, middle of some very challenging times, oh, and yes. you have to watch out for gerrymandering at a, a, AGMs. Yes, you know, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we've had our own fun at those. You, you made obviously a very good case why, why, why this is good, good for the college. Can you be certain it's good for patients as well? Um, well, my, the, the, uh, I mean, the best, the best proxy for that is all the vo voluntary sector organizations, National Children's Bureau, um, uh, BLISS, um, uh, Together for Short, Lives Council for Disabled Children. We've consulted with all of those. They're really keen and really supportive. Uh, but m uh, the other two really key groups are our patients and carers advisory group who think this is absolutely the way to go and perhaps even more important than that our youth advisory panel who are going great guns and want to be on the board of trustees. Um, so I'm hoping that, well, I mean, some of, I've got, I've, we've certainly got some GP colleagues, say, on the Children's Young People Outcome Forum wait, waiting to uh, join and, um, and wanting to be part of this. Um, we, there, there are, we've got quite a lot of shared interests, obviously, with the RCGP um, on, on some of this work. Um, but um, the Royal College of Surgeons, Norman Williams, is watching with interest because he's thinking about whether there would be merit in having a foundation of surgery. Um, and similarly, um, Obs and Gyne, I've had chats with them, um, and you know, there's obviously you know, resonances for them too in arguing for women's health. We've had really strong support from Sue Bailey um, at RC Psych, um, and, um, and uh, you know, there would be a credible first chair for our uh, board of trustees. Um, uh, so I'm closing in on her if we manage to pull this off. Yeah. Is that the right thing? Um, it's, it's, it's one important thing, but, um, you know, we had a policy breakfast the other morning, and school nurses is a huge, huge issue. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, community children's nurses, we've got real shortfalls in community children's nursing. So I think it's the whole healthcare mm -hmm. Uh, sector. Um, it, in terms of uh, education, supporting GP education is absolutely critical for us. And so, you know, that would be a key part. In, t in, in terms of our education, our delivered education, um, education would be a cross-cutting function. So there's some delivered education that's entirely for doctors of, that our college does, but I would hope that we would be able in this kind of model to do more multi-professional education as well. And Wendy Reid is supportive of this as well. Thanks for that. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. If you, uh, how many pediatricians have we got in the room? Okay. Right. <laughs> if, 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 okay, okay. If, okay. So if you, okay. Right. So you're not allowed to vote. Okay. So if I said option one is, if let's pretend you're all pediatricians. Option one is no change. Option two is the two-armed model, and option three is fully multi-professional college. Let's pretend you are pediatricians. Um, how many people are up for option one? <laughs> uh, I'm preaching to the converted, you'll know. Fun. How many people are up for option two? Option three? Oh, there we go. So, you think we're being too, too feeble. <laughs>
an organisation with a college and then the other group of people who are greatly involved in health and social care and pediatrics. So it may be that it's a subsidiary rather than a dominant organisation. Okay, brilliant question, because that's the thing that, the, the, that lots of people have said, why don't we do, set, do this as a separate organisation? So two things. One is that we, uh, there are two bits to it. One is we're not doing it as an organisation of organisations. So we're not doing it like the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges because the problem about that is that when everybody has to go back to their sovereign groups and come back, it's very hard to get... Um, um, to get a sort of consensus position and it weakens and s it slows down what you can say. It's like the, the Children's and Young People's Outcome Forum. So we'd expect mostly members to be there in their own right, although we do want some way in which the smaller voluntary organisations can, can have organisational membership. But setting up a separate arm's length organisation well, we, had, well, we spoke to all the other organisations. Nobody's interested in doing it. There isn't the money to do it. So we've got, you know, 20% of our operate, 20 or 30% of our operating costs invested in the work we do around policy, research, um, 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 uh, you know, all, all of that stuff. We've got our comms team, our IT, our building, all the rest of it. Um, and so to duplicate, if we, if we set all that up de novo, you'd have to duplicate all of that infrastructure. Um, so you'd need, you know, a, a couple of million quid. And then if we were really, really successful, you've just rendered our college, you know, um, irrelevant, if you like, or not irrelevant on the training side. But so, um, so I think this is the only way to start it. But it's quite conceivable that in you know, five, ten years, the two parts of the organization might split off and the foundation might then fly as a separate organization as we have from RCP. And I don't have a problem about that, but I just don't think, you know, I don't think we, there's the money or the time in the, in the system at the moment to duplicate a large work program that we've got already where actually we can start by just getting more people around the table as a, as a, as a, as a, as a starting point. Okay, so we're not going to—it's not going to be magic overnight. But I think it's important to try and grow our. Well, first of all, just in terms of working together on things like workforce, integrated workforce plans, um, having a partnership of equals around the table—that's a, a much better starting place. And other organisations, other you know, other professionals have said, "Yes, we'll come in on this, but we have to be equals. We're not sitting at your table. We have to be equals in the." Fa foundation half of the college they rec you know they recognize that our board of trustees will probably have a majority of pediatricians but you know nobody's got a problem about that because um, you know for the obvious history of the organization but I think you know potentially we can grow our influence over time and you know, what I would say about um, investing in diabetic control, we've got poor outcomes on diabetes control, asthma. If we don't invest in this now, the costs of renal disease, cardiac disease, everything else in those kids when they grow up, the cost of obesity in childhood, it's like global warming. You know, it's going to cost us a fortune in years to come if we don't do something about it now. So that's the lobbying position that we need to grow influence on. It'll take years, but if you don't start, you don't get there. very much. It's a uh, fascinating uh, talk, really. Can I just ask you to look in your crystal ball if option three comes to pass about where paediatric medical trainees will be training and being educated in the future in terms of settings? Uh, okay, so um, I think, well, so this is, a, this is another whole issue. I think we need far more paediatricians working out in out of hospital settings alongside um, GPs. I should say straight away that I do not think primary care paediatricians should do what GPs are doing because there's 40,000 GPs, there's 3,000 paediatricians and kids are a quarter of GP workload and they're much, much better at first contact care than we are. But actually, if you had more paediatricians working in a sort of primary care network, more children's nurses, um, a raft of other professionals working alongside uh, GP so that say eight or ten practices or a confederated group owned their pediatric team if you like um, then I think that would stop a lot of escalation up to hospitals um, and uh, so that's the kind of model that I think the bulk we should you know should uh, uh, be the future for the bulk of pediatric care. Peter? Hilary thank you very interesting um, my question really is just going on from that I mean in the States, they have something called an office paediatrician. Mm. 
which is not an all singing, all dancing consultant, um, but is not a primary care physician. Does the college have any views on maybe a half house form of five years of training in pediatrics? You know, so registrar equivalent, full membership, but being able to go out into primary care and do exactly that, stop lots of hospital referrals coming up. Is there a view on that? Well, I think if shape happens, that's, that, is the well, that is what the training will be. But I think, you know, I think if you're working in primary care, you should have, a, you should have you know, what we have already, but you need you know, to have a bit more training in you know, preventative pediatric, you know, in, 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 in the other things. In Europe, you have a common STEM, and then you either have primary care pediatric training, secondary or tertiary. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we have just got to think out of the box about these different models. Um, and uh, yes, that might be, that might be a, a way forward. Um, but, you know, in five years or five or six years, according to shape, you'd be fully trained. And that's, you know, the, the American primary care pediatricians are trained in even less time than that. Uh, can I, I, I can I sneak you into my AGM? Yeah, <laughs> handing out some fellowships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There'll be <laughs> honorary <laughs> fellowships will be <laughs> dispatched at the door. <laughs> I, I like to thank you again. Uh, kept everybody uh, excited at the end of the afternoon. So thank you very much. For Pleasure. That. Thanks very much. Thank So just very briefly, because, um, oh, David's going to sit down. He's going to take a seat. It's all right, sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> it's not going to sing. He's going to sit there. Um, just to say um, thank you again to um, everybody for coming today, and thank you to all the brilliant speakers. I know some of them have had to go today. So Rob's had to go back to work at Brighton. Um, it's been a fascinating day. I've certainly learned a lot. I think one of the things I've learned is I don't think I'd pass the recruitment test to become a 111 call handler. <laughs> so um, I need to stick with what I'm doing, I think. Uh, we're going to send, I believe, all the, the write-up and the feedback out to everybody. Just a few thank yous. Um, I want to thank um, Jane Chopin and Synergy for organizing the event. Um, Tom, do you want to have anything? <laughs> Jim you today. Um, I want to thank um, Alison and David for putting together a really good agenda and getting some really brilliant speakers, I think, today. And again, I think that's worked really well. Um, and I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to invite um, Abdul to join us, but not just yet. Um, for some, for, for a lot of people in the room, you probably will know that this is David's last um, major um, HEKSS event and, and sort of conference. Um, I just want to, and I know on behalf of myself and Alison, want to personally thank you, David, for all your help and support over the last 18 months. Um, we will miss you. You're going on to great things. All I'm going to say is it's an office overlooking Regent's Park. That's all he keeps saying. So um, I know that Abdul's got some um, much better words and sort of things that he'd like to say. So I'm going to invite Abdul up to, to say something for, on behalf of all of us. So, Abdul. Thank you, Philippa. I've got the microphone there. Um, as Philip has said, uh, David Black is moving on to a prestigious uh, role as medical director for the Joint Royal Colleges of Physicians Training Board. So it's quite a basically prestigious role. Um, David has been Dean Director for the last 10 years and uh, I've been fortunate to work with him over the last 10 years, and we've been through a lot of changes. And what is striking, his passion for education and training. And he has achieved quite a lot, and I'm going to highlight some of his achievement for you to remember it, that basically that what he has done. He was the first to set up uh, GP, uh, um, medical uh, specialty schools uh, in the country. He set up the National Careers website on behalf of the Department of Health. He set up the novel concept of uh, 
local faculty group as a driver for local education governance. He set up the national trainee pilot for revalidation, and since then he's been chairing the committee. He was an expert advisor to uh, Robert uh, Francis QC for Mid Staffordshire in 2009, 2010, and 2012. So he has done a lot, and I guess this is time that on your behalf, I'd like to thank him for his commitment, for his passion, and wish him success in his new role. And David, I've got a small present on my behalf that I'll give you for the work that you've done. Thank you very, thank you very much. That's very, very kind, Abdul. Of course, it's a complete lie. I don't do any of those things. You do all those things. And, and I, I, I think, um, I, I say when I came in, I, I'm medical manager. You're all the educationalists. Uh, there are many people in this room who are far more expert in education and have been through, I think, almost all our heads of school have got masters in, in ed, 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 education. Uh, so uh, I think my job was simply to appoint good people and to let them get on with it. And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, everybody has got on with it, and I think almost without exception have overachieved. So I actually want to thank you for making my job easy, and I shall miss you all. Thank you. On behalf of Philippe, there is some uh, refreshment outside before you go. Yes. <laughs> so please join us uh, with a drink with David. David? <laughs>